Hey, what's up? Good evening, everybody. I'm Councillor Clinton Woods, and excited for you guys to join me today. I think uh, when we're looking around the country, we're seeing so much, so many things happen. So many people are are open to change that that maybe haven't been in the past. I think we've seen a lot of light bulbs go off in people's minds, and uh, I've honestly been having a lot of conversation with people that are, are finally able to acknowledge that um, you know some intentional harm has been done in certain communities and. Uh, that has resulted in significant income and wage gaps that we've seen here uh, throughout our nation and, and even in Birmingham. And so I think it's important to, you know, as we're talking about the changes that need to be made, the things that need to be corrected and addressed, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, logos changed. I've seen a lot of names changed. I've seen monuments taken down. You know, we've seen a lot of people in various different ways acknowledging and accepting and admitting that they need to do do something to make sure that they are uh, respecting other people and, and giving other people fair opportunities. And so I think that uh, the natural next step of progression for that is to make sure that we are looking dead at uh, the income and wealth gap. You know, we've seen uh, everything from unrest. We're in the middle of a pandemic. And this pandemic has done a lot to really expose a lot of disparities that we see, specifically in the black community, when you're talking about, uh, you know, medical care, health and wellness, you know, the rate in which people are dying. And so we're seeing more and more disparities be really unmasked and it's in a way that uh, nobody's able to ignore it and so one thing that we have to do or one of the things is at the root of a lot of those things is is poverty however you want to look at it but specifically today we want to talk about the uh, wealth gap and the income gap and furthermore uh, what can the public sector do what can the private sector do what can the nonprofit sector do to address that issue and so we're talking about uh, you know the income gap the wealth gap you know, we have a lot of indicators that, that kind of point to some of the flaws in that, in that system. And so uh, before we get too deep into it, I want to introduce, I have a, a basically a guest speaker today, man, that's really going to share uh, Isaac Cooper, IMC Financial, one of the, uh, I'll say, brightest young financial minds of my generation. So I, <laughs> I wanted to get, get him to come in and talk to us about some of these issues and then specifically kind of get into uh, a going forward a next steps thing as how do we, uh, close this gap. You know, we look right. around and we, and we hear everyone talking about it. We hear everyone, and nobody disputes that it exists. Um, you know, people have different arguments as to why, but I think everybody can agree that it needs to be fixed. Right. And so specifically in the climate that we're in today, I think it's more important than ever to start talking about what can we do specifically uh, to start getting that done. But uh, real quick, you know, uh, Isaac Cooper, like I said, IMC Financial, uh, one of our Really bright young financial minds here. I think you've got got uh, one child. Got one more on the way. Yes, sir. Uh, so you join it. You joining me at two? Or are you going to stop at two? Uh, I, yeah, we'll, we'll see uh, how things evolve. I hear you. Doug. I've, I've made the decision to stop at two. Okay. And so you you live you, you live your life. Man. You're the money guy, so you be able as long as you can afford them. Uh, and so, but yeah, I want to get into it, and so just kind of want to get some thoughts from you. Um, as to how you see these issues and, and definitely so I want to toss it over to you and you kind of uh, jump in where you want to and we'll kind of go from there. Yeah, that's great, man. I, I appreciate the opportunity. This is um, a, a huge reality in which the world is able to see a lot of the injustice, but also how vulnerable our communities are. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of events that have happened historically that really gives a good snapshot of what we see today. And I think some of the solutions that have been implemented, if it's in the private sector, if it's in the public sector, if it's within uh, uh, government in general, um, some of the solutions that's been, um, we'll just say applied or attempted, it may not have had in mind the, the complete perspective of the historical factors that cause a problem for the, uh, for the residents. And so the pandemic, uh, more importantly, has really highlighted the injustices that, um, as you mentioned, black, family, black families are living with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, um, you know, we share with our clients, if there is not enough money on a day-to-day -day basis, on a month-to-month -month basis to operate, there's two ways in which you can, you know, impress that. That could be either making more money or spending less, yep. right? And so, um, when we look at the, either the, the wage gap, and which is a, a huge issue on just the fact that I believe it's about 400 Americans have more wealth than 155 million yeah. Americans let combined me, let me, together. Uh, let me jump in right there. I want to I want to circle back and just talk a little bit about more what that wage gap is. And so when we're talking about the wage gap, um, you know that's the fact that 
uh, you know, in, in our country, basically the median, the average wealth when we're talking about black families is $17,500. And so when we're talking about white families, that jumps up to $171,000. And so that gap in between is, is literally just the difference in wealth between, you know, the average white family and the average black family. And so, you know, that's the gap we're talking about. I didn't want to uh, just start talking over that and, and not make sure everybody knew what we were saying, but basically that is the gap that we're, we're really pointing to. And so there's a lot of reasons that kind of pour into that. And so we'll be getting into that more as we go. But uh, in essence, that's, that's the issue. You know, you've got 17,500 uh, basically net worth for a black family. And then right. that, that same uh, average net worth for white family is 171,000. And so that is the gap, the gap in wealth that we're talking about. And so, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, if you, if you have money, you tend to have less problems than people that don't. And so that is, you know, at the very most simplistic way I can say it, I think that we have got to make sure that we are, uh, one, understanding that, but two, being sensitive to that and, and, and seeking out actively actionable methods to fix it. And so right. I'm going to throw it back to you. Like I said, I don't want you to start using all your big financial terms <laughs> and people get lost. Uh, I wanna... <laughs> no, that's that is spot on, right? The, the ability to generate an asset is going to directly impact your ability to live on a day-to-day -day basis. And even some of the historic causations uh, back in 1865, when we look at the majority of the assets that were used at the time, it was people, right? right? And so Absolutely. the the valuation of, of of that was about three billion dollars, in which you know essentially you have employees that you don't necessarily have to pay for. And so the ability yeah. to accrue wealth in that format, the ability to be able to preserve that wealth, is going to have a direct impact on your ability to transfer it to the next generation. Right. So when when we look at some of the numbers in regards of the um, if it's the average net worth, um, if it's the amount of, uh, we'll just say, property that a particular household has. or, or Right, and so you said something right there. When you, you said something about passing it on to the next generation. Right. And so you cannot, like you can't pass on what you don't have. And right. so that speaks directly to the fact that, you know, look, in our country, 44% of uh, black families own their home mm -hmm. versus 74% uh, of white families. And right. so you see that that's another gap but at the end of the day, that, that, that home is probably one of the, the biggest assets that most people have. And that's so right. a lot of times that's what gets handed down. I mean, and so we're talking about, uh, you know, you talked about 1865. We moved up to 1965 and we started seeing different issues. But, um, you know, and redlining and we're not going to try not to go back too far in, in history because we want to talk about solutions going forward. But, that's right. uh, you know, we're in a lot of cases, we're in the first generation where, you know, like, uh, you know, I know the first person in my family to own a house. And mm -hmm. so, you know, we're, you know, and, and so that's, that's probably something that's unique in a lot of, yeah. uh, uh, you know, not that unique in a lot of black families. And so I think we have got to uh, fully understand and honestly have a conversation about where we are right. and intentionally start working to fix some of the things that have been done uh, intentionally in the past. And so, right. uh, but yeah, you can't, you can't pass down what you don't have. That's right. That's right. And, and, and even when we look at the, the, the role homes play and one's ability to generate wealth, then we look at the valuation of those homes, right? And so even the 44% uh, of black Americans that, that own their homes, the valuation in comparison to you know, their counterparts may be a bit different or it is a bit different. And that, that is um, in the fabric of some of the intentional policy that disrupted it. And so as we look at some of the solutions uh, especially around home ownership, a, a lot of what we are dealing with, really regardless of race, due to the fact of um, just the way financial education is somewhat forced upon you, <laughs> the way in which you got to learn how to deal with money once you either get out of college or go into college or right. you get uh, signed up for a credit card and you don't necessarily know what the ramifications are, what 30% utilization ratio is and all the different factors to be a – uh, a, a viable citizen economically, right? right? Like that basic information, that actually needs to start at elementary school. Mm. And the fact that that is not embedded within our, our school system, we are not essentially equipping our residents and, and the individuals that is going to help circulate the economy or the ecosystem in which they live in um, with the proper tools to be able to manage the resources that they have. Right. And, um, and, and what we've seen over time is this uh, um, I don't want to say it's the spirit of entrepreneurship that mm -hmm. has um, been ignited, which I've really enjoyed because a lot of the solutions we are looking to impose upon 
either for our household or for our particular business, um, it's really going to be tied to an EIN number. It's going to be tied to the ability to control your time, but also develop a, a way in which you can get paid for the value in which you provide for someone else and which you can dictate what that dollar amount is. And so uh, housing plays a, a huge role in a, in a household's ability to diversify. It's yeah. it, the way in which it participates in just basic fun functionality and also uh, plays a huge role into education, right? right. And so, and, and the safety, and so the that that household is really the anchor economically, but also um, socially. You right. know, when it pertains to what you have access to, and so a huge part of you know wealth in itself is the network in which you um, can communicate with and get professional uh, expertise. You know, if you go to a, a cookout, and you know you may have a, a, a cold beverage, and you you know, talking over some ribs, your network is going to dictate that conversation and that conversation could dictate the wealth in which you could accrue over time. Mm -hmm. And so there, you know, John Hope Bryant says it all the time. If you hang around non broke people, you'll be the 10th. Right. And so that uh, uh, environment is, is definitely going to play a huge role. Uh, so, yes, specifically okay. around housing. All right, so yeah, I mean, that's, and so kind of going into that, I think we hit on education and the need to kind of to teach. And so I think a lot of times we're asking young people to to know everything at 17. A lot of times the first thing they go out and do is get get in debt, whether it's college or or other things, toys, cars, other you know, get in debt without really understanding that long term impact. Mm -hmm. And so I think education is going to be key. But all right, and so like. You know, we, we know what the problem is. We kind of see we see the issues, and so we are aware. But um, you know, honestly, like I look around nationally, I've had conversations with people, and um, you know, the things that have gone on in our country since uh, the killing of George Floyd, and mm. so we're we are in for some very tough, very uncomfortable conversations with people. Uh, but they're they're necessary in order yeah. to kind of get the changes that have to be made to close that gap. Because yeah. I mean, it's not acceptable to talk about these disparities, these gaps in income and wealth and, and not be kind of pushed to go out here and figure out, what, you know, or what's the plan. And right. so I think that's what we got to shift into. And so we can, we can jump into the public sector, we can sure. jump into the private sector first, but, um, you know, just looking at, you know, say the public sector. And so we're, uh, we're in city hall. And so I think, <laughs> I think it's important to have, it, have these types of conversations here. I right. think at the end of the day, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of, funds are controlled and flow through and get directed and uh, cities and right. municipalities and other governmental entities. And so I think that, you know, a lot of contracting gets done mm -hmm. with cities, with mm -hmm. counties, with states, with federal entities. And so the government has a, a major ability to, to create some equality, mm -hmm. to build capacity and other things. And so I think one of the things we have to do, and I'm going to definitely let you jump in, I'm going to just throw throw some sense in there on the top, but I think, um, you know, things like a local preference ordinance to be able to, mm. you know, businesses that are in Birmingham, be able to work with uh, those businesses that are local. And so when you look at, you know, working with businesses that are here, you know, not only, uh, you know, businesses that are here in Birmingham, whether it's black businesses, you know, they're going to be more likely to hire black people. They're going to yeah. be more likely to train black people to do what they're doing. And so um, you look at things like that, you look at the fact that, okay, if you're doing business with people in Birmingham, uh, you're going to get the benefit also to the dollars being recycled in the same place. That's right. And so, you know, you get to see uh, some level of return back to you right. in some kind of tax revenue. Uh, right. You know, right. so we've got to uh, find a way to do more businesses with people that are invested in this city. Right. And so I think that's going to be something important. I think another thing we've got to do is, is really uh, take a harder look at, uh, you know, non-discrimination uh, laws. And so there's federal mm. laws on the books against that, you know, basically say you cannot discriminate. And so we need to make sure that we are doing what we need to do to make sure that's not happening. And so that's, uh, that's in city hall, you know, that's any of our boards and agencies partner, or even if they don't partner with us here in the city, I think we need to make sure that, uh, you know, that's being enforced. And so where we can, and so we've got to, uh, you know, really be intentional. Like mm -hmm. I said, we talked about some of the things that were done that intentionally harm people. And so yeah. it was, um, uh, it, you know, it's heartbreaking. And so a lot of these things are uh, are still happening. And so typically I read books, and so you'll like this, because I only read books about money. Like, <laughs> like I don't, like I don't I only read nonfiction, 90% right. about money. Okay. But I've been going back and reading, um, you know, more, um, you know, looking at different documentaries, reading people's biographies. And so 
I was like reading Fred Shuttlesworth, uh, his mm. his biography, and um, you know he was talking about a situation where the bus driver wouldn't drop his kids off at at home. Mm. Like the bus driver would purposely drive his kids four and five blocks past the house to make them kind of just be stranded and have to walk back. And so he followed. Uh, you know, one day he he chased the bus down because he was home, pulled in front of the bus. You know, they end up calling the supervisor to come out there after a bunch of back and forth and threatening to call the police. They took the kids back and dropped them off at home. The mm. bus did. He made the bus turn around and take them back. And so, you know, I tell that story just to say that that bus driver's still alive. And he yeah. might, you know, he might yeah. still live in And so that, that wow. attitude and mentality is not that far removed. Right. And so as much as we want to say uh, things are different, you know, everything has changed, like these type of things are not that far removed. Like if you know the guy that did that, <laughs> you know, you kind of can see how close we really are to, to really having that solid footing and a true opportunity, right. uh, you know, really being in that first or second generation that has that legitimate opportunity to go forward. And so, you know, I think that's why, um, you know, when we talk about that intentionality that needs to happen, right. you know, you have to do it because of like the level of opposition and mm. uh, that was put up against people being able to advance in right. the past. And so, um, but yeah, like public sector, how do you see governments, uh, you know, whether it's cities, counties, states, the federal government, how do you see them being able to play a, a, a direct role in impacting and closing that, that wealth gap, that income gap? Yeah, that's, and that's, th those are, one, those are great recommendations that you shared. Um, and, and two, I think um, they essentially set the tone, mm -hmm. right? So even when you look at minimum wage, that, that typically sets the tone uh, when it pertains to the amount of, of money one can make based off of that particular duty. So that, that's something I feel like should be, there should be an honest assessment there. You know, what does it really take for a household to live on a month-to-month -month annual basis? And can someone pro provide for their household based off of that, uh, that dollar amount? I think the other uh, vehicle that, um, of course, is directly affiliated with the government is a, this is more so at the federal level but there could also be some policies or some procedures that is um, supported at the local level around the earned income tax credit right mm -hmm. and so that is a pool of money in which we don't necessarily have to go out and get right and there's not new money it's money that already exists it's just ensuring that the most vulnerable communities have the right infrastructure information to be able to capitalize on it too potentially, you know, bring in some five figures based off of, you know, how many dependents they have. And so I think that's another way in which we could quickly see a turnaround on some um, implementation. Uh, when it pertains to businesses, uh, and I'll just speak for um, just at the city level, identifying ways in which they can get some type of, um, I don't, I don't want to, it could be a tax credit by prioritizing the people in which they are looking to hire, right? And so a lot, typically tax benefits are tied to, um, even when it pertains to retirement contributions, right? Like that, that's another mm -hmm. element when it pertains to federal and local um, policy and incentives that we could create because there is, I wanna say it's close to $160 billion in tax credits that you get through you know, uh, contributions towards a 401k and qualified products. What type of incentives can we place around general savings, right? Mm -hmm. You may, you shared a stat earlier that I believe it was, um, or, I, or, I, or I may just be sharing it now, but 44% uh, of Americans in the event of a $400 emergency, mm -hmm. they're going to have to go take, get that from somebody, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so yeah. that, that is a, a, a problem and it's really not rooted in income, right? right? That, that's more so rooted in um, and habits, and so I, the, I think the way in which we can incentivize some of those habits, the uh, one at the federal level, but also at the local level, we can help. Um, we, we may not be able to eliminate the gap, but I think we'll be able to, you know, one one bite at a time of the elephant to to get closer and to uh, ultimately empowering the residents, right? Because right. some of the uh, a lot of wealth has to do with. Um, more so what is intangible, right? It's from the neck up when you think about wealth. And yeah. so even when you think about the term, um, you know, I, I feel like capitalism at sometimes is misused. Mm -hmm. um, the root word of capital is capitas, which is Latin, which means knowledge of the mind. Bring and so down. ultimately that Bring is down. you're paying someone for their knowledge, right? And so I, I think 
we um, just develop incentives on how we can um, encourage, educate, but also give enough uh, confidence in themselves to execute on that. So I think that the, the uh, government can play a great role in um, protecting the citizens as well as they go about that go about right. that journey. All right, yeah, you hit on some other stuff that I honestly wasn't thinking about, and so that's uh, – one, that's why you call in an expert, but you, um, you know, really like really taking advantage of the money that's on the table. And yeah, so, right, like, right. make sure that people are able to one, know about and also maximize, um, you know, the money that's available. And so, I was watching a thing uh, earlier this week, but it was really talking about something as simple as like TurboTax. And so, yeah. if you make like less than $79,000, you can file your taxes for free like through any of these uh, online services. So TurboTax, uh, but instead of like making it easy for people to file for free, they were basically tricking them into using the paid site mm -hmm. instead of using the, the free site that they mm -hmm. have to provide to. And so they were getting a lot of people to pay um, when they had access to it for free, mm -hmm. but they didn't know. Mm -hmm. And so that knowledge is like, there's really money and resources available to you. And so, um, you know, and so when we're talking about this, and so a lot of people may say, well, you know, that's not the role of government. You know, the government mm. is not supposed to, uh, to do these things. But I think it's, um, you know, and personally, I'm an I'm a econ guy. I'm mm -hmm. a, a free market economy guy. <laughs> and so I think that uh, people are kind of out of line or off, off base when they're talking about uh, kind of government shouldn't intervene or government mm. shouldn't do these things. But, you know, nobody really has issues when the government intervenes for, you know, tax breaks or right. you know for big companies and so when you hear like a company like amazon didn't pay any taxes last year you know what i mean so you're <laughs> like nobody you know that's kind of like oh well that you know and so i think you know but that's the same type of intervention you know that is that is government intervention that is government when companies are, are getting ready to go out of business and the government steps in and saves them that's right. government intervention i mean that and they do it because of the greater good of all these people might lose their jobs and things like that. And I get it. Right. But this is the same type of intervention. That's and right. so we, we have uh, really at the very lowest level uh, a need to make sure people know uh, how to knowledge. And so, right. you, you know, I mean, you mentioned some very basic things, um, you know, of one, just some as simple as the earned income tax credit, making right. sure you're maximizing what is already basically yours That's like right. what is already allocated for you right. making sure you're taking all that in because a lot i mean i'm sure a lot of money's left on the table that, oh a, a ton and i and to your point even around the uh filing for taxes we actually uh you know the whole world and but specifically here in the u.s we were able to see the lack of uh of a relationship with financial institutions mm -hmm. in the most vulnerable communities because there's a number of individuals, millions that have yet to receive their check that qualify for mm. it, and it's due to the fact they don't have a bank account. Wow. So the fact that they could not put a routing and account number or wow. they never listed that on their tax return, that delayed their ability to get essentially 1200 2400 whatever uh, that dollar amount was for the household. Wow. And if they lost their job, we'll just say the first week in April, wow. and we already talked about how 44% of Americans were $400 away. So just imagine how that could cripple um, a household. And, and again, that's already been suffering yeah. quietly, right? Yeah. And, and so it's um, I, one thing in which we, we, we are very passionate about is that we never, especially at, just with the team, we never feel like a, someone's tax bracket should dictate the professional experts that they have access to mm. and unfortunately that's wow. the way in which the model has been set up especially in the financial services that unless you have assets you you know is nine times out of ten somebody from one of them big old firms ain't gonna give you a call and say right. hey let me let me let's let's see what we can do um but but i think at the government level i, I really love the way in which you shared that um because ultimately it's it's a partnership mm -hmm. right and and so if we have healthy residents you know, essentially at some point, they will be healthy employees. If they're healthy right. employees, they're healthy taxpayers. And then, you know, of course, it all trickles down into their kids and, and their ability to be able to own property within the city. And so there, there is that um, multiplier of it. Um, I do think at the corporate level, depending upon the size of the company, mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, the larger companies, definitely some intentionality on how they are um, one, um, how those services directly align with the most vulnerable communities, right. right? And so don't do anything out of the box, right? Like what do you normally do 
uh, in regards of your services and then what are some intentional ways in which um, we can address this if it's through education, if it's, um, I just saw that um, uh, the gentleman, Robert Smith, that paid off the student loans mm -hmm. for Morehouse. Uh, they are taking 2% of their profits and they are investing it into uh, black entrepreneurs. Wow. Very specific, very tangible, right? right? And, and you can do a lot of good with that, especially, you know, the amount of income he got going on over there. And so I, I think at the corporate level, um, I, I would say probably the first thing is listen to your workforce. What are, what are the pain points are they communicating? You know, if it's financial, it could be student loans. What, what are some of the unique ways in which we could, um, you know, put together an employment contract that could potentially address some of the student loans. Um, if it's the education, you know, getting out of the traditional way of educating your employees. Right. Yeah, health insurance, all that's good, but but are they, do they have the capacity to come to work and focus on their objectives and their duties and not be distracted by a financial concern, mm -hmm. you know, before they left the house, right? right. And so if, if there's an issue at the house, it's gonna follow you to your workplace. Right. Um, and then as well, I think more, uh, probably more creative ways in which they could, um, well, I won't say creative, more intentional ways in which they could uh, communicate a trek of, um, we'll just say, executive opportunity, right? Yeah. Like, what, what are, what's the pathway for development in that process? And so I, I think corporations have a, they, I won't say they have the responsibility, they have the unique opportunity if they want to claim that responsibility. I think a lot of it is going to be dictated on how companies um, really transition in this new normal, right? Everyone is adjusting because of the pandemic and the usage of technology. And so um, I think companies could really, really, I won't say make a dent, but they could really empower what they currently have mm -hmm. and ensure that they can have a generational effect, you know? Mm -hmm. And so this impact is nothing in which we will be able to see the full maturation of it within our, our generation, mm -hmm. right? Is when you know, our two, you know, your two kids, and I may have four or five, but um, based off of, you know, whenever they're 50, <laughs> I know my wife is watching this, but, uh, but based off of whenever they're in their 50s and 60s, right, like what we're discussing now, we'll be able to see more opportunity um, on, on that front. Okay. Yeah, I mean, and so I think you kind of shifted over talking about that private sector, corporate America, various sized businesses. Right. And I mean, I think it all comes, we're, we're in a place where intentionality is gonna be required to fix it. And so it's yeah. like, this is not a problem that's gonna be fixed organically mm -hmm. because it's not a problem that was created organically. And so we can't just expect, uh, you know, more and more time to solve it. And so we keep talking about that wealth gap, um, you know, as people will say, well, more education, more access to education. And so, you know, we, we've heard that, but, uh, you know, black head of households, you know, basically have two thirds of the wealth Yep. of white high school graduates mm. that are head of household. And so the education doesn't necessarily uh, close that gap. And so we've got to find out intentional opportunities. And so I think, um, you know, specifically for businesses, I think they have got to be, uh, you know, one more inclusive. I think a lot of times mm. decisions get made based on who's in the room. Yeah. And so I, I think back, I think I want to say it was, uh, it might've been, Red, I don't want to say Red Cross, but there was a, uh, there was a flyer, possibly, because it was one of these companies, it might have been YMCA or somebody along those lines, but they put out a pool safety flyer. And so you had about, you, know, you had just a bunch of kids playing at the pool. And so, uh, you know, they had a green check mark if you were doing, doing something right, and you had like an X, red X, if you were doing something wrong. Hmm. And so some kind of way, like, every black kid in the picture was doing it wrong, like running, <laughs> like, <laughs> diving in the shallow end, just all this stuff. And you're looking like, okay, like if it was one person in the room, they'd be like, you know, hey, Bob, you know, yeah. it, just, it might've been a different conversation. And so you see how, but yeah. I mean, if that's a flyer, right. like what other like policy decisions are being made? Right. What other, you know, what other things are happening because the wrong people are in the room or the right, right people aren't there. Right. And so I think that piece is like an immediate need. And so I think we've got to start requiring. And so I am, um, you know, personally, I'm kind of looking at being at, finding ways to be more intentional and aggressive in this space myself. And so, uh, you know, finding what kind of requirements we can put on businesses to, to show their, uh, you know, diversity, to show their, uh, the work they do with minority businesses to right. have to, to have to present that on a right. yearly basis, uh, specifically if you're going to do business with, uh, with the city or yeah. with the state or, you know, and right. so I think we've got to, 
uh, come together and set some of those actionable items. And so right. that for me is like, you know, it's just, you know, what it, however, you know, we got to this point, this is going to be the, the thing that we have to push up the hill. And so, right. Um, right. you know, we kind of look at the generation before us, they had a set of struggles that they had to move the ball forward and they did that. And so we've got, um, you know, we've got a position where we've got to move the ball forward. And so that's right. going to be a, a, an immediate need, but it's going to require uh, that word again, intentionality. It's not right. going to, it's not going to happen by itself. Uh, people aren't going to uh, give up money and power willingly. You know, it's going to be, you know what I mean? It's, it, we're in for some very hard conversations. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, like people are caught up in this idea of scarcity. Mm. So they think that if you have something that I have less of something. And so, you know, what we've seen is that, you know, the, the water will rise. I mean, the market will continue yeah. to correct itself. Like if you, right. if there is demand for what you're doing, you right. know, you will always have some work. Like you'll always be uh, able to turn that into uh, money. You'll mm -hmm. be able to convert that ability, that product, that talent into dollars. And so that's what, uh, you know, we've got to do. And so, like I said, I'm personally, I'm open to ideas, to thoughts. Like I said, I'm not somebody that, that thinks they know everything and mm -hmm. I'm always calling and picking people's brains, but um, you know, whatever going forward, I, I think we've hit on some things that we can start working on now. Yeah. But I think that there, you know, there's more room for more voices in this conversation. There's more room for, uh, you know, additional ideas, better ideas to kind of move this thing forward. But I think we, we see the problem in a lot of the things right. that uh, people are upset about are, you know, a lot of the systematic issues. Just, they're just income, they're money as well. Yeah. And yeah. so if you have money, you can, there's a lot of problems you can solve. Uh, money, you know what I mean? And so it's just certain things like that just ain't that big a deal. You right. Know? Right. Just, Cause I remember, I think I got a flat tire and mm. I was just like, you know, it was like, dang, I got to go by and get a tire, you know, was, but like, I remember getting a flat tire, you know, like 15 years ago and it was like, whoo, like, like, <laughs> like you call it mama, you praying like, you know, why does it always got to, you know, so uh -huh. you, it's a different, you know, thing. And so you've got to make sure that we are, uh, one, you know, exposing more people to, uh, you know, what that financial responsibility looks like, that financial literacy uh, piece. Like we talked about the kids coming out of high school and the first thing they do is go borrow, mm -hmm. you know, five figures. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, the first they graduate and immediately do that and no one has prepared them for that. No one has prepared right. them to, to really know what is their return on investment. Like you're borrowing this money right. that you got to pay back. What are you getting in return? Right. And so I think those are some things that we've got to look at. Um, you know, but it's, it's not you know, like I'm looking at this thing and you, you look at, uh, and that's, that's the problem with systematic problem is there's no one to, to point at. And so that's one thing, um, you know, like you can't, you know, like people will, people have passion and energy and they, they will attack. Mm -hmm. But it's hard to know what the target is when yeah. you're talking about a systematic problem right. or systemic, if anybody correct me, but systemic yeah. uh, issue. And so, um, you know, you look at that, you know, you look back into the 60s and there was a clear, right. like, oppressor. Like, there was, like, we, right. this, is, this is what the people are doing to us and we need to do this, this, and this. This is the goal. It was very clear. Right. And so when you talk about something like poverty, like, you can't, it's hard to point at Just one thing and say, you know, we need to, that's the problem. And right. so it's a variation of items, but, you know, in order to fix it, we're just going to have to hone in and be very intentional when it comes to how do we close this income and wealth gap. And so right. if we close the income and wealth gap, we're, we're reducing the amount of people that are impoverished. Right. And so I think those are things where, uh, you know, I'm going to solicit, if you got ideas, share those. Like I said, send those in. I thought it was important to have this discussion uh, literally from City Hall and, and really yeah. have this talk because I think, uh, the city is going to have to play a key role in it. And I think uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, most, uh, you know, people, most businesses, you know, are going to take their cue from the city, in, you know, in some form or fashion. At yeah. the end of the day, like businesses are businesses because they're going to be profit maximizers. Yeah. And so if something changes and there's opportunities for other people, they're still going to be profit maximizers. They're still going to keep showing up and doing good work. They're still going to keep, uh, you know, delivering and, and, and achieving in their own spaces. And so, right. you know, we don't have to be afraid of someone else getting an opportunity. It's not anything to be afraid of. And so what we have to do is one, as a community, as we're removing these symbols of hate and racism, we have to understand everything that went with it. It's not just a monument. It's not just a flag that represented a lot of harm and a lot of uh, oppression and a lot mm -hmm. of things that happened to people like people. And so I think right. people like to disassociate it 
like history, like no, that was somebody's mom and right. dad, you know. That, you know, so and I think we have to kind of <laughs> connect those dots, and so understanding one that it wasn't that long ago. That's right. You know, it wasn't that long ago, and so I can sit down and have conversations with people that were not allowed to drink at this water fountain, mm. or you know, and, and and we're sitting here, you know, having a different fight, but. Uh, you know, one is going to take people really getting, uh, really wanting to get behind and push this. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, this is a conversation we need you no know, more ideas. We're going to need more support. But I think that, you know, aiming at the income gap and the wealth gap are really what, what has to happen in order to see some long term change. Like if, right. if we see people making more money, we see people getting out of poverty, we see people building wealth. Uh, you know, people are going to begin to have more tools to better their own communities. And so, right. um, you know, that is something that we got to do. Right. So, to yeah. simplify it, people got to have some money. That's right. <laughs> uh, and a lot of it. And I'll take some more as well. <laughs> um, uh, just, man, a few quick points. And you you said so much. And this is uh, one thing I appreciate is just the posture that you have um, in this space, in the midst of this pandemic, because the, the reality is, is that it, you know, it's, it is in health crisis and it, you know, blessings to anyone that's been impacted. Um, but it also highlights, um, you know, how strong a mindset needs to be in the midst of something in which you feel like you don't have much control. And so staying in a posture of solution, I appreciate uh, right. that, that, sir. Um, two things I, I wanted to quickly uh, mention. Uh, when, when we look at the efforts of Dr. King and, and prior to his assassination, um, you and I both know his efforts were around yeah. economics, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, when we look at the previous generation, um, and there's even a time now in which, you know, we could easily go to the grocery store and, and run across someone that they are actually the first person in their family to be born with all their rights. Mm. So as you said, it's a stone's throw away. It's right down the street in regards of some of the things that have been um, endured right. historically. Um, I, I, I would be remiss to say to not highlight the OG, triple OG, A.G. Gatson yeah, and his efforts and laying the blueprint um, on how we could model. But I think I, I think more than anything for the black community, black entrepreneurship is the um, it, it's going to be the the most uh, uh, consistent way in which the black community will be able to have more control on the way in which we can include the community on this economic mobility. Um, access to capital is gonna be huge, right? And so probably another phase of this could, could, could be talking with the banks about being intentional on providing um, capital for businesses that may not have two years of, of income to show to right. go to the bank and get going or may not have the family members. And so I think this focus around economics will allow us to be able to touch the different pockets of one's livelihood right. um, to ensure that if it's the government, if it's the private sector, all the way to our our, um, our nonprofits and, and foundations on how we can um, really wrap our arms around the community in this moment. And so, I, again, thank you for um, allowing me to join this conversation. Right. Um, and uh, oh yeah, well, like I'm glad great. you added that because like that is one thing as big a role I think as government has to play. The banking sector yes, has sir. equally, you know, or even more of a role to play because. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they control so much of, you know, where investment dollars can go. Like yep. A lot of times you get two investors, they go to the bank to try to get money for a project they want to do. Uh, the bank controls like, you know, what areas literally get get dollars. And so, you know, I'm hearing stories of people going to, you know, our local banks trying to get funding for uh, to do projects. And, if, you know, well, if you're in this area, you know, your building is worth zero. <laughs> You know, if you're over here, okay, how much do you need? And so it's like, uh, you know, one, it should be, you know, we should be able to get some fair valuation of property, right. you know, one. And so we we as a city have got to look at that. Um, and for instance, like you see Avondale, you know, Avondale was, a, was an area where, you know, we saw a lot of growth, we saw a lot of investment, you mm -hmm. know, but unfortunately the people who maybe own property, say five years before, everything right. went off may or may not have been the same people that owned it and didn't get to take advantage of the growth that's right and so you know as a city i think we have to do something to be able to protect those people that have invested in areas and so right. i think working with the banks um you know to be like it's got to be intentional there is no you know tried like it's got to be an intentional effort to really 
right wrongs to, to kind of create, you know, this correction of what we've done intentionally for so long. And so we've got to be more intentional about that. But banks are going to be uh, really at the center of it, whether it's, you know, it's being more intentional, more um, long term oriented when you're talking about the, the implementation of CRA, you know, just kind of yep. doing things. It goes back to what you're talking about. Make sure we're maximizing what's already on the table right. while we're pointing to, okay, what needs to be done better. And right. so I think we've got to figure out, okay, how do we create some fair valuation system? Right. I mean, because right. I'm looking at projects now. It's an area where the city is about to invest a ton of money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but they're telling private investors that their property is worth zero. Mm. And so those things are like, <laughs> like are, you know, it's concerning. And so right. if we've got people that are willing to put their own money up, um, you know, put their own collateral. You know, we're not saying, you know, do a bad deal. We're not saying don't get your required collateral. We're not saying any of that. Right. You know, we're just saying, how can it be zero? You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> and the I doorknob costs $10. <laughs> you know, right. like, how can it be zero? And so it's... Uh, but it's having those conversations. That's right. So we're, you know, we're in for some uncomfortable conversations. Yeah. And so I don't mind having, you know, I don't, you know, some, right. my wife might say I have one too many, but, I, you know, I don't <laughs> mind uh, having those uncomfortable conversations. And so, um, unfortunately, it's just going to be necessary. And right. so where we are nationally, it'll be a shame to not truly advance. Right. And so. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate you coming in, man. Yes, sir. I, um, you know, you came to my mind first to ask a few people. I was like, you think brightest, uh, you know, <laughs> financial mind in the city. And uh, you were, give me, I, I told people, give me your top three. I was like, using everybody's top okay, three. So okay, like, now. I and, like that. Uh, so I appreciate you coming on. Yes, uh, sir. If anybody's watching, if you got ideas, if you heard kind of what we're talking about, income gap, you know, wealth gap, if you've got thoughts and ideas on how that can be closed. Uh, you know, we need to talk. And so we need to kind of expand this conversation. We need actionable steps that can be taken. Um, like I said, I'm not sitting here saying I know all the answers. I don't, you know, I don't know. We're still in this situation. And so uh, we need to find out how we can move the ball forward, what that is. And so, like I said, uh, the, opti the, the optimism comes from uh, really the amount of people that have really begun to open their eyes and want to participate, um, you know, people that in the past would not have even agreed that racism existed or like, Oh man, these money, we got to get the, you know, and so you, you're seeing that happen. And so we've got to kind of push that forward and, and carry that momentum for it. Um, but lastly, before we go, man, I couldn't have you on and not, not make you get a people of finance tip. What do you have for the, for the people out there that are, that are uh, managing their finances and what's one thing they can do to, to be better? Give, give them just, just one tip now. Oh, just one tip, my man. goodness. All right, but I got I to gotta give, give I got to uh, separate it because we're, we're in the midst of a pandemic. So if, um, if you are no longer receiving income, um, be, get as lean as possible when it pertains to your expenses identify the expenses in which you need to prioritize, but also reach out to any, if you have credit cards, uh, if there's a mortgage or rent, if you're having trouble, get ahead of it and reach out to those providers to make sure that there's any, there's no penalties, there's no problems on that, on that end. And so even though that there isn't any income coming in, let's get very intentional on making sure we can minimize the expenses. Now, for those that are still making money, um, Typically, some of the things in which you are not incurring right now may be you may not be traveling as what as much because you're working from home. Um, some of your normal expenses that you would occur at work are not um, happening because, again, you're working at home. How much money can you save in this new normal? Because, again, at some point we're going to transition back into uh, being at the office or, or working your normal nine to five. How much money can you save in this pandemic or, or throughout the duration of this pandemic to be able to look back and say, even though my time was shifted um, uh, when it pertained to how I work, how did I capitalize on this on this moment? And so um, if anything, budgeting is the foundation of any type of, um, um, we'll just say accrual of wealth. Um, and and uh, I'll just leave this for all the households as well. Wealth transfer we would like for it to occur in bank accounts, right? And trust funds and all that good jazz. But the, the wealth transfer that will outlive all bank accounts is gonna be at the dinner table. So mm -hmm. communicate the strategies and the opportunities with the loved ones that you have, your family members, so they can start understanding what they need to do to make sure that they are a good steward of that once it gets to them. Boom. That was good, man. Okay, all right. <laughs> 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 that was good but like, and so like 
but that's real. And so, like, yeah. I know personally, like, uh, I think me and my wife, uh, we've been married. We've just been married nine years as of, like, last week. Congratulations, so brother. We got nine years in. But I think about, this was probably, like, 2017. Yeah. It's about a little four or five years ago or so. Um, you know, I, we got like a deep look at the finances. I was like, oh, yeah. We, yeah, we should be doing better. We need to. Yeah. And so <laughs> we literally was like, all right, we're going to get out of debt. And so we just start getting that knocked out. And so mm -hmm. really that communication as far as what's the game plan. I know you always got that hashtag planning, but That's right. it literally started there, just that communication. And I mean, it was ugly because it was like, if, well, this, if you didn't always order such, a, you know, <laughs> so it was like, but I mean, once you get past that, it's like, all right, let's just clean this up. That's right. And so then you immediately can shift to, uh, to wealth building. And That's so, right. I think it's uh, having those tough conversations and so, but um, yeah, if you want some more finance stuff, uh, holler, holler at Isaac, That's but right. uh, I appreciate y'all joining us. Like I said, if you've got thoughts, ideas, you want to join this conversation, uh, just let me know, reach out, send me an email, Facebook message, anything like that. So I appreciate you tuning in. And so, like I said, this is a problem that uh, we've got to keep on the forefront and we've got to work to solve it. And so I'm committed to doing that and I appreciate your time. Have a blessed evening. Stay safe, mask up, stay oh, yeah. away from the beach. Ask up.